Good afternoon. On behalf of the Jefferson Madison Regional Library, welcome to the virtual program, The Reality of Game Development. Thank you so much for joining us today. And please do remember to keep checking jmrl.org for a complete and frequently updated schedule of programs for all ages. My name is Tim Carrier. I'm the Young Adult Services Manager with JMRL and my colleague, Megan Smead, the Young Adult Librarian for the Central Library. She is also here to assist with today's event. This event and all JMRL events have been made possible by the incredible and generous support of the Friends of the Library. This program is being recorded for possible inclusion on the JMRL YouTube channel. So if you'd like to rewatch the program or have a friend who couldn't attend, barring any major technical issues, uh, we'll try to get this posted in the next few days. For anyone curious, the mics have been muted for today's event. We ask that if you have any questions during the course of the program, please enter them into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. But toward the end of the program, we'll take time for a Q&A and try to cover as many questions as possible. But if there is a pressing question during the course of the discussion relevant to the topic being addressed at that particular moment, please don't hesitate to ask and we'll look for the first available opportunity to address it. Additionally, the closed caption transcript has been enabled for this program. You can activate the feature by selecting live transcript at the bottom of your screen and to receive subtitles. Please note that despite the prompt you might receive, the ability to save or download the transcript is not enabled. And also the transcription is not perfect. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Josh Beiser is a game industry analyst with more than 10 years experience discussing video game design and the industry itself. Along with writing and making videos, he's interviewed game developers around the world. He's given presentations in schools and libraries and at conventions aimed at spreading awareness about the craft of game design and what it means to work in the game industry. He's the author of 20 Essential Games to Study and Game Design Deep Dive Platformers. So please join me in welcoming Josh Beiser of GameWisdom.com. Thank you, Tim. And uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for attending live. I'm going to share my screen now. And hopefully you will be able to see everything. There we go. And this is, as Tim said, the reality of game development. Uh, this program is one that I came up with to kind of talk about what it means to get into the game industry today. It's a topic that I'm sure everyone who's played a video game has thought about at some point in their lives. And uh, these lovely little screenshots are from an old commercial from the 90s that pretty much got everything wrong about what it meant to make games for a living. But as for a little bit more about who I am, um, like Tim said, I run Game Wisdom. And since 2012, I've been specializing in talking about the art and science of games. So essentially, I've kind of become this middle ground between the consumer side and developers. And a lot of that has come from being able to interview so many members of the industry. I would say at this point, I'm probably over like 600 different interviews. And a lot of this discussion, a lot of this topic has really get, basically gave birth or been a form from these conversations and talking to people in the trenches and everyone from those who just started out to veterans of 15, 20 years plus in the industry making games. So with a topic like this, like this is one of my larger presentations. And even with that said, there's still going to be a lot that we won't be covering. So what we're gonna be talking about tonight or I'm sorry, for today, is the kind of work that goes into making a video game. Specifically, what are the major tracks or kind of design dis disciplines that you'll be able to look into and possibly go to school or learn on your own? We're going to be talking about the differences between working at a major studio and going the independent route. Over the last decade, one of the major things that have changed in terms of the game industry has been the rise of indie development. And I'll even have uh, slides in a section dedicated to talking about what you can do right now, including programs and engines that you can literally download as soon as you're done watching me and try to make something with it. 
And of course, we'll be talking about the current landscape when it comes to the market, who are the major players, stores, and useful information that you can look into now. With that said, what we're not going to be covering. We're not going to be talking about what colleges or schools you should go to attend to learn about game development. One of the reasons for that is that game design is one of those very unusual disciplines that there really isn't a quote unquote formal training for it. And because of that, it's opened up the door for everyone and anyone to get into it. So trying to give you ideas or suggestions about places to attend schooling doesn't really help. Obviously, interviews, resume, and portfolio hub we're not going to be talking about as well, especially with how much the indie scene has grown and that you're not really held to working at a major company these days to get into this industry. And of course, a step-by-step -step guide to making a video game because that would certainly be more than an hour's worth of talking. And if I had a step-by-step -step guide to becoming rich making games, I would be doing a lot more of this talk for sure. But let's start with some good news. Why this continues to be the best time to get in the game industry. The 2010s has been huge in terms of growing not only the pop culture acceptance of video games, but also just the idea that this is a legitimate industry. 20, 30 years ago, video games were considered this joke. That it was a thing that you do if you couldn't find a job somewhere else. And that anything that involved with the industry was just going to be this passing fad. In the 80s, there was the game industry crash. And that kind of tempered a lot of enthusiasm about making games for a living. But... In the 2000s, as the industry really exploded in popularity, that kind of went away. And then the 2010s, with both the rise of the independent scene, as well as esports becoming more and more of a dominant force, it's been officially accepted at this point that video games are here to stay and that schools, colleges, and everyone else should start treating it in the same way as going to other industries and other disciplines. And especially when it comes to the independent scene, that you can do a lot with very few people compared to, again, 30 years ago. And because of those different aspects, it's become a lot easier and a lot more credible to make games. The independent market is huge. And over the last five years in particular, more and more unique games have been made in this space that have gotten the attention of not only the major companies, but also the mainstream market. And as game engines and tools have evolved, you can literally make a game anywhere in this world. I have interviewed developers who have worked on, who, have, who live in three different continents who have never been in the same room, let alone the same state as each other. And through the use of stuff like Zoom and Discord and other software, they're able to make a game. And like I said at the start, game engines in particular have grown in power as well as usability. 30 years ago, you would need a full team and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars to create an actual game. Today, you can download a game engine for free, and if you can learn it and do something with it, you can make a game and put it up on a major store, and that could be the start of your game dev career. And none of that would have been possible without the rise of digital distribution, which for the kids in the audience, you've probably used something like Steam or download games from PSN or Games Pass or the Switch Store. That wasn't there 20 years ago. And the fact that we can do everything digital these days has really opened up the door to a lot of creativity. And this is just a, not even a snippet of the many indie games that have gone on to become major successes over the last 10 to 12 years. I'm sure a lot of people have heard of Stardew Valley at this point. It's one of my favorites. But the other two, I always like to ask if people have heard of these, because Fez was kind of one of the big three. It was Fez, Braid, 
and Super Me Boy that were kind of the first three indie games that Microsoft promoted. This was back in, I think, 2000, between 2009 and 2012, that kind of gave people this idea that, hey, independent developers can make a lot of amazing games. Darkest Dungeon, probably a little bit too mature depending upon the audience here, but this was a game that just went through every aspect of indie development. It got a successful Kickstarter, it got huge word of mouth, and the developers now have become recognized worldwide because of this one game. Another major uh, pool when it comes to the independent space has been the growing uh, or the growing use of diversity or accepting of more people with independent developers compared to the AAA space. And I think a lot of people have generally felt this uh, sentiment that kind of more acceptance and more inclusion in the independent space has led to more discussions and kind of reaching out to a wider audience in the AAA space. And this has been especially true when it comes to LGBTQ plus developers and creators. There's been a lot of games aimed at that audience from people in that space. The game on the left is the title Boyfriend Dungeon by Kitbox Games. And it's kind of like a dating visual novel game that looks at or kind of focuses on different uh, genders and things along those lines. The game on the right is Nowhere Profit. And this comes from, I believe it was an Indian developer who was making games about kind of the culture and mythology of India and was putting that in their games. And there's been, especially with over the last five or six years, more and more games focusing on different cultures and different communities compared to where it was at 10 to 15 years ago. And we've seen from the independent space these games getting a following for exploring a topic or a group that normally isn't really discussed, especially when it comes to the AAA space, that typically tends to still skew towards the 18 to 30 kind of white male crowd. But it has been fascinating to see so much interesting designs come from the space and why it has helped kind of legitimize independent development. Now, another trend that occurred over the 2010s has, of course, been mobile games. And there have certainly been a lot of them. And the mobile space, depending upon who you talk to, could either be this little thing you do in your spare time or your, you know, game addiction <laughs> day in and day out. But the space is cheaper and easier to design games with and has opened the door for even smaller studios compared to the independent developers. And there is a huge gambit of indie games. I even, the upcoming book that I just finished my manuscript on is all about free to play and mobile design. And these are a few of the many examples of games that have blown up in that space, but it has become a little bit trickier to get in. And that's kind of a part of one of these sections later on in this presentation. But let's get to the basics here, because this is, I'm sure, something for everyone watching you are very interested in. When it comes to game development, it's a very multidisciplined field in terms of actually being able to take an idea in your head, turn it into code on a computer screen, and then turn it into a product. One of the developers I interview, I think, said it best, that video games or a combination of entertainment and programming. And because of that, it takes a lot to make a game, let alone an amazing one. Now, when it comes to funding, this has certainly changed over the past 15 years and even beyond that as well. Originally, games were so expensive that they needed funding from either a major company or a publisher to kind of cover the bill. But today we've seen crowdfunding become a popular way that you can use a service like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, and there's, I think, a few other ones as well, to fund a game along those lines. But 
one of the most important lessons is that even the smallest, most minuscule game idea that you can come up with will always take time to be made. Because a lot of that is figuring out how to make that work in your engine of choice. I'll include a list of engines later on in this presentation. But when it comes to kind of the entirety of game development, there's essentially three distinct tracks. You have the design side. So this is creating the actual game mechanics, creating the systems, anything that involves the actual implementation or experience of your game. You have coding, the actual putting things into a computer, creating the actual programming logic, making sure that the game actually can work and doesn't break a console or a computer. And that can also change based on what engines you use and even just the scope of the game itself. There are games that make use of what's known as procedural generation, which is the idea that the game is creating or shuffling content during the running of it. And that takes an entirely unique set of skills to work with. And of course, the aesthetics, what you are seeing and experiencing in the game, the music, the art, the actual tone of the game, all these aspects go into making just one singular game. Now, you probably noticed that I have kind of like a Venn diagram kind of thing going on here. And the reason why is that for a lot of people who get into the industry, they will usually either understand or work in one or all three of these separate aspects. But there is even more to this because we can even break things down even further in terms of the various tracks. For most of the major companies that I'll talk about in a few minutes, they're going to hire somebody for a specific job. While for a lot of independent teams, they will wear multiple hats. Now, you've seen or you're probably noticing that lovely little rectangle that I added to the top there. Because for a lot of companies and for a lot of people trying to do it on their own, there are far more, I guess, boring skills that go into this. But the actual management and development side of a game has, have often been the linchpin, whether a game will succeed or fail especially when it's just you and a few people you know trying to make a game. So this is a question that it constantly is on my mind when it comes to doing this talk and talking to people about game development in particular. Is there such a thing as the pure designer? And what I mean by that is, can somebody with no artistic skill no programming knowledge, who only knows about the design and implementation of games, is there a place for them in this industry? And the long answer to this question is, I don't know. <laughs> when I first started getting into talking about game development in the industry, this was back in like late 2000s, the answer was no that people wanted you to know either art or programming and design was considered secondary to that. A lot of people who get in the game industry are typically artists or programmers who will then go out on their own. Oh, I'm sorry, was there a question? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I heard a noise there. <laughs> but over the past decade, especially again with more colleges and institutions really getting in the game industry or wanting to teach that, it's, this question has become a little bit more murkier. And I do feel that more and more people, especially companies, are understanding that understanding programming, understanding art, they are important, but they're not the same as understanding design. The, obviously, these screenshots are from various Mario games, and the creator, of course, Shigeru Miyamoto, originally joined Nintendo as an artist, and of course, he then became kind of their game design guru after that. But I do feel that this question is going to change, especially over the next 10 years. The 2000s was kind of the game industry blowing up. The 2010s was the industry becoming more accepted, and I feel like this decade 
is when a lot of these standards and kind of foundational stuff is going to become more and more important. And that's kind of been my bread and butter talking about, again, what does it take to make a successful game and more importantly, design a successful game? So who knows, maybe in the next few years, I'll be changing this slide around. <laughs> now, another major aspect about game development is, of course, working at a major company versus working on your own. 20 years ago, this slide would not even be included because there was no independent space outside of a, of a uh, select few. But again, over the 2010s, this has become a very viable option. And for a lot of people who get in the game industry at a major company, they may go and form their own independent studio to kind of be able to work on the games that they want to make. When it comes to indie versus AAA, it all is a difference of refinement versus uniqueness. AAA studios can refine and they have the money and kind of manpower to make fantastic games that are usually some that we've seen before. And pen developers don't have that, but they're far more agile in creating these uniquely designed titles that you have never seen before. And why cover more independent games these days compared to the AAA? But when it comes to working at a studio, the big thing is that studios will usually have employees in the dozens. In some of the larger cases, they could have hundreds of employees on different continents, basically all working at different uh, branches. For studio work, funding comes from either a publisher who either will have a stake in the game or the company, or the studio may invest their own money. And when it comes to the AAA space, it is all about putting together some of the biggest, most expensive, and of course, some of the highest earning games in this space. Now, this particular slide, chances are I have to update this like every five to like, every like six to 10 months in terms of whatever the hottest games are. But I am sure everyone here recognizes at least one or more of the games on this slide, especially, of course, Fortnite, which I think is still considered incredibly popular, especially among teenagers these days. With that said, what kind of has uh, caused a lot of people to leave the studio space are the downsides. When you're working in a major company, you are hired to do one thing. And that one thing is whatever the studio demands of you. If you're hoping to get like freedom to make a game that you want or you know do things on your own, unless you're a lead, you are just going to be part of that faceless crowd. If a studio hires you to, let's say, uh, render grass textures, then I hope you really like designing all varieties of grass in this game because that's going to be your job. Studio development is very risky along those lines. When there are millions of dollars being put into these games, it can become very stressful to work. And if that game fails it can lead to those studios losing a lot of people or just outright closing. And there have been a lot of horror stories as of late of employees being overworked and even sadly in the last year, cases of abuse happening at major studios. There have been discussions about forming a game, a video game industry union to kind of get around these issues, but it's still very much an active situation right now. But one of the major things about working in a studio is that there's two different kinds of employees. You have your full-time kind of your core team, and then you have your temporary or contract people. What studios will often do is they will start working on a game with their main people. And then when the time comes to kind of expand and get into really active development, they will hire or they will contract people from the outside. Those employees will oftentimes have to uh, move or relocate to those studios. But again, one of the interesting aspects of the last few years, of course, with everything being shifted virtually, is that may have changed at some of the major companies. But one of the things that they will do to kind of 
get people to commit to these studios is the promise that they will be hired as one of the main people after the project is over. But in a lot of cases, that is not guaranteed. And there have been a lot of sad stories of developers relocating, you know, across the continent or even across the world. They finish their job, they're let go, and they don't know what to do now. And they're in a uh, different place they're not used to. And that has been one of the reasons why a lot of people have gone to independent space with that little dancing spider being happy there. But that is from the game Web. That is one of my favorite games of 2021. And that was very much a case of an independent developer and showing off what are the major advantages of, of being an indie. You can literally make whatever game you want. You are not held to a, a shareholder or to you know somebody breathing it down your neck to tell you, you need to make this game like this. And again, with virtual options, Discord, Zoom, and so on, you don't need an office. You don't even need to have like a physical space. You can do it all from the comfort of your own home. And there are a lot of indie developers who have done just that. And again, the artistic side and the creativity from these games has really given a lot of people an outlet to express themselves and made projects that would have literally never been made outside of these independent studios. And again, every one of these slides has to be just consistently updated with all the games that have come out year by year. So of course we have Celeste, which was one of the few independent games to win a major award, focusing on themes such as depression, panic attacks, and even having a, a very popular following in the LGBTQ plus space. Not only that, but it's also a ridiculously difficult platformer. Minecraft, the 10-ton gorilla when it comes to a lot of game recognition, that started as an indie game. It, I remember when it was just this little game that no one ever really heard of. And today, it is a game that I'm pretty sure every child has played at some point. Gone Home was an emotionally driven game. Again, about very unique and interesting themes surrounding LGBTQ+, as well as getting to a very serious talk about some other content that is a little bit behind, I think, for this library talk. And the game Discord Elysium, a very strange game that no AAA studio would ever consider making. And the developers got this game out there, and it has become their studio-defining title. With that said, though, there are some major downsides of being an independent developer. And this is something that I've really explored over the last six years with growing my YouTube channel and talking to more developers in this space. It is very hard when you are starting out as an indie developer. You are going to have to be earning money somehow. And for a lot of indie developers, they will usually take second or part-time jobs in order to finance these games. And for a lot of them, they are going to work game to game in terms of having enough money able to keep doing this. The market has exploded and there are now like 30 to 50 games being released weekly from independent developers. And that makes it very hard for your game to stand out. And because of that, it's time to get to, I guess the scared straight portion of this presentation and why this is the worst time to get into the game industry. As I said a few seconds ago, we have gone from one to two games being released monthly to 30 to 50 games being released weekly. There are so many titles coming out that the consumers are flooded with them. There are more games than I think there is time to ever play them. And because of that, people expect high quality. There was a period where 
if you just had a game only store page, you succeeded. It didn't matter what the game was. It didn't matter how much you priced it. It was so few games being released that it didn't matter. Nowadays, your game needs to be, you know, dynamite in order for it to succeed. And for every developer that has succeeded, I can guarantee you there are dozens, if not hundreds of developers who did not. And it all leads into all these different aspects that have to work in order for a game to be able to become a success. You need people to find your game. And of course, that's why discoverability is a major point there. And the window for a game to succeed is smaller and smaller and over the last few years. It used to be that you had maybe one to three months of from the time your game was released for your game to kind of find its groove and its audience. These days, it's a few weeks. And there are so many ways, unfortunately, for a game to fail. And we do not have the space. Like I said, this is one of my longer presentations. I can talk about this stuff for like two to five hours if you get me wound up. And I always have to resist going too much into detail about that in these presentations. Now, this has been something that kind of caused a huge gut to the game industry, or to the independent space from about, I would say, 2014, 2015 to maybe 2018, 2019. Things have been slowly improving, but there was this market trend known as the race to the bottom. There are so many casual games and free-to-play games that the consumer just said, why should I spend $20 on your game or even $10? And it caused a lot of developers to really have to focus on, you know, the most minimal viable product that, you know, we'll just make a game and sell for $2.99. But the problem is that the longer you spend on a game, the harder it becomes to get that money back. Now, the good news is that chances are, by the time I give this presentation again, I may not have to talk about the slide anymore because there has been this tr growing trend of more quality games. But it's also kind of been in response to this slide that it is very hard to make a living off of video games. It's also incredibly hard to make a living doing YouTube with video games or just YouTube in general, which is another topic that I talk about in another presentation. But at the end of the day, if you want to make a living in the game industry, money needs to come from somewhere. And for a lot of students and first time developers, this is the slide or this is a topic that they struggle with the most. That it doesn't matter if you make the most creatively expressive game that you have ever made if A, nobody's played it, and B, it bankrupts you in the process. And it is incredibly easy for these games to balloon in scope. That something that you thought would take a month, maybe five to six months, can turn into a two to five year long project if you're not careful. And it's why there's so much about the topic of managing a game that is oftentimes a, the reason for success or failure. And when you are making a game, it is inherently risky. And it's been a major topic of a lot of the videos I do on the Game Wisdom channel is trying to give developers information to mitigate those risks. There are a lot of people who you talk to about how to get in the game industry, they will tell you, just make games. And oftentimes, those are the people who you don't want to listen to, I'm afraid. There is a massive difference between making games for yourself or, you know, doing it, you know, whenever you feel free and literally living off of these games and using that to, you know, keep yourself going. And sadly, there are a lot of cases of games that did not do that, and those studios and companies going under because of it. And 
it is unfortunately one of the riskiest markets or one of the riskiest industries to get into. And again, if anyone tells you otherwise, they are unfortunately either lying or they don't understand that. And one of the good things is that you have, you're watching this presentation to give you an idea. But this right here is kind of the mantra for this section that if you want to be successful at in the game industry, it takes more than just making a really great game. Because I have played amazing games that have failed. <laughs> There's one of my favorite games, I think it was 2018, 2019. In a year of it being released, it only has maybe 20 reviews on its major site. While successful games can get thousands or tens of thousands. And to succeed in this space, there's a lot of secondary skills and things you need to learn. You need to be good at reaching out to people, of marketing your game. You need to be able to get people to play your game and learn from how they're experiencing your title. I have seen many indie games and many student games that I can tell that nobody outside the developer actually played this game. And it shows with just kind of the experience being poor. And even being able to manage 2, 5, 10, 20, 30, even more people and being able to organize them to make a game is incredibly essential as well. And it's why this lovely guy having an existential crisis has been like the perfect image to show off, you know, how crazy it'd be to make a video game. And... One of the other major points is sadly failure. It is unfortunate, like in a perfect world, every game would succeed. It would get enough money to keep the studios going. Sadly, that doesn't happen. And one of the things I tend to try and hammer home when I'm talking to students and first-time developers, you have to plan for failure. That you shouldn't be, your business plan shouldn't be I'm going to spend 10 years on this game. It will succeed and I can retire to a private island because I can guarantee you that for most people, it doesn't happen. And the very best developers and those who have su survived and succeeded in the space have learned to mitigate the risks in any way possible, understanding you know, how long they should work on an idea, when to get people interested, when to do marketing. Because if you can do that, you can mitigate that risk, it will let you survive for another day and keep making games. The screenshot right there is from the game Cuphead. This was a game that started out as a small project from the studio MDHR. And when the game started to get more notice and they got picked up by Microsoft, they went all in. They took a second mortgage out on their home and they just kind of dedicated themselves completely to this game. And guess what? It worked. It, Cuphead became a celebrated game. They have a Netflix show, I believe, in the works now. And the studio's future is secured. But it could have also not have happened. And again, for every story of a studio blowing up, there are many more that have not. And the, again, the reason why I'm talking about this and why it may sound scary is that I don't like to see studios fail for whatever reason. And a lot of people tend to ignore the failures. And it's why this presentation is called The Reality of Game Development. Because it's not always this amazing, super happy fun time. And if you don't understand those risks, you know your game can fail by death by a thousand cuts because of it. So here's the good news that we're just about done with the scary part. And it's time to talk about what you can do right now. The fact that you're watching this presentation, either you're watching it live or recorded on the channel here, is a good start because you're starting to learn about what it actually takes to make a game. One of the things that you can do now, especially for every teenager watching this, is to start thinking seriously about what aspect of game development you want to get into. The beauty about being in school is that you can start looking at these things now 
as opposed to when you're out of school and college and you have to worry about other things. Again, there are people who have gone to school for one thing and then find their passion somewhere else. One of my friends who I talked to several times about game development, he originally was an accountant. And after a uh, life and death scare, he decided that I won't go make games for a living. And now he has his own publishing studio and makes games like that. But you can start to look and dabble into the game dev space now. You can start to see, okay, maybe I want to get into art. But you know what? Maybe I start to become very fascinated about programming games and start to really focus on that. This is also the time to start developing your secondary skills and doing networking and finding other people, friends, and you know people who are also interested in games to maybe try and make a project together. But it's time for the fun part, to talk about public game engines. And like I said, these engines for I think 90% of the cases is going to be free to use. And they are powerful industry accepted engines. Like these are not like secondhand store kind of things. Like the people and the games that have been made through these engines have gone to make millions of dollars. And like I said, you can, there are spaces where you can upload these games and try and sell them. I'll include those slides after this section here. And this could be the start of your game dev career. Now, one important thing to keep in mind is that some of these engines, they are free to download and use, but if you intend on trying to sell this game, they may attach a fee or require you to upgrade your copy to make use of that. So for all these engines, always make sure to kind of read the fine print for when it's time to actually publish a game if you decide to go that route. If you just want to mess with these engines and try and make something on your own, feel free. So the first engine is Unity. Unity has kind of become the banner for a lot of indie developers. It works because it has enough power and usability to create just about any game that you can imagine. You can make 2D and 3D games. And again, this is a legitimate engine. The downside, of course, of this is that it does, if you want to make something that you intend to sell or show other people, you need to understand the programming side and understand, you know, one of the many languages out there. And of course, have somebody who can do 2D and 3D art as well. For me, when I use Unity, the extent of my talent was basically a blue square moving on a line to hop over a red square. And again, there are, at this point, thousands of games that have been made in Unity. We have the game on the left, Hollow Knight, one of the more celebrated 2D games, and Ori and the Will the Wisps, another fantastic game. And when it comes to Unity, I do know the rules about this in particular, that if you intend to sell the game, you must either upgrade to a kind of a, a developer's license, or they'll let you kind of put the splash screen made in Unity before your game loads up each time someone plays it. And again, those are things you'll have to consider if you want to sell these games. Once I've seen it, take a quick sip. Now, if you're looking for something that is far easier to learn, but not as powerful, there is Game Maker. Game Maker is another one that is free to use, but it also has different versions if you want to do more with it. What makes this one kind of special is that while you can, of course, code and do programming with it, it's not as required as the other game engines. How it works is if you look on this uh, uh, screenshot that I have right here, they have a lot of code set up as these kinds of uh, pre-developed chunks or categories. There's a jumping command. There's a movement command. So what you can do is take this, attach it to a character or to an object in your game, and then you just tweak some values. Say, okay, I'm going to make the jump button uh, spacebar, or I'm going to make the jump button circle 
on my gamepad. And the code is already set up for you to do that. And because of that, this is a really great kind of first timer or first step in the game industry. The downside of Game Maker is that, of course, it is not as powerful as the other game engines. It is predominantly used for 2D games. And there's a lot you can do in the 2D space. But if you are trying to make a fully realized 3D game, there are other engines that you can use for it. So these are two examples, or very two diverse examples, of 2D games. The one on the left is Hyper Light Drifter, which is a very challenging high-speed action game. The game on the right is Forager. This is kind of like a casual, uh, kind of like a crafting, building kind of game. It originally started as a game jam. That was an idea that was created for like a 24 to 40 hour long period. I believe it either took home first or second place. And the developer said, well, if people like it, maybe we can turn this into a full game. And it came out and has been very successful since. Now, in the complete opposite end of the scale to Game Maker, there is the Unreal Engine. Unreal is arguably the most powerful consumer engine that you can download and use. The reason why I say that is that many studios will have their own studio-wide engine. This is among like the most more powerful and biggest game developers. And those engines are only used for those respective companies. But Unreal has made their engine publicly available. And this is it, basically, uh, boys and girls. Like, If you want the most powerful engine to make a game with, right here, you know, go download it. The advantages of this engine, again, is that it can be used for just about any game that you can imagine. The complexity of it is its major downside. Because it is its own unique engine, it has its own unique rules and elements to it that wouldn't really be transferable to the other game engines. It is also, thanks to kind of Epic, the uh, creators of it, trying to be more powerful and popular in the game dev space, have made the engine royalty free. So there is very little risk or very little cost to you to try and use this engine. And if you can learn this, and I mean, even if you can just make like a portfolio piece of stuff in the Unreal Engine, you are going to really be ahead of the curve of a lot of other people trying to break into the game industry. And of course, here are a few examples. Again, Fortnite, a game I'm sure nobody's ever heard of. And the game on the right is Little Nightmares, a horror game that has some very like freakish like art style. But again, it just really goes to show the diversity and the power of these engines. And then if you're looking for something smaller, I'm just going to talk about this very quickly. There is RPG Maker. This is a kind of a uh, editing tool that is sold on most digital stores. The whole idea about this one is that this is for RPGs, and that's it. They made their money on selling things kind of a la carte. So for every little thing that, that you want or could put into this game, they have a separate microtransaction or purchase for it. It is incredibly easy to use, especially compared to the other engines, but again, it is far more limited and kind of, excuse me, pigeonholes you into just making RPG style games. And why for a lot of people who are trying to be more professional industry, they'll typically move away from RPG Maker to one of the other major engines. And there are other engines out there for sure, but these are the kind of the more popular ones. But no matter where you start, the most important lesson to understand is you want to fail small and you should also fail fast as well. Something that I hear from a lot of developers is that their first game that they make, if they were to go and do the exact same thing again, it could be done in half the time. Because when you are starting on the game industry, you're not, all, you're not only trying to make a game, we are also learning about how to actually use the tools to design that as well. And it's why for a lot of first timers, 
they sometimes get in over their heads. They're going to try and make their magnum opus as their first game, their five to ten year long title. You never want to start out that. And one of the things I see from a lot of indies these days is that they will often work on several smaller games, maybe even just work on prototypes of games. You know, they may spend one to three months on a prototype, and then they'll move on to something else. And then once they feel comfortable and knowledgeable with their design, then they're going to invest in that, you know, one to two to three year long game development. Usually if a game goes into five plus years, even if it's part time, something unfortunately may have gone wrong or is not working right. So uh, with that said, uh, for the kind of final section of this presentation, I just want to check my time really fast here. Yeah, we're like just about at an hour. We're getting close to it. So we're like right on pace. For the final kind of part of this, I want to talk about some of the important terms and places that you should cover, you should know if you want to get in the game dev space. The reason is that there's this major disconnect between the people who cover and talk about games and the people who actually make games. It was one of the reasons why I started Game Wisdom is that I want to know more about the game dev side and there was very few credible information out there. So I just said to myself, I'm just going to make it myself. <laughs> and you're going to find as you get more and more interested in the development side and the industry side, that major sites like IGN, Kotaku, watching like gaming YouTubers doesn't really help you as much compared to you're just playing games for fun. And again, Another major point is the rise of crowdfunding as a legitimate way for content creators to earn money or earn a living off of their games or to get a project off the floor here. I have my own Patreon that people donate to that I that has helped me in the past. And this has been something that more and more indie developers have used to get the funding they need to either finish a project or get something beyond, you know, just their own limited funds and availability. But let's talk about storefronts, because if you're going to make a game, you're going to have to put it somewhere if you want people to see it. And of course, the big one, Steam. Ten years ago, I'm pretty sure if I were to ask people if they know what Steam is, a lot of people just go, huh? <laughs> but today... Steam is it. They are the biggest, most influential digital store on the planet. Valve has gone from being a well-known developer and publisher to now one of the movers and shakers of the game industry because of it. The store has become essentially the lifeblood or a second home for a lot of consumers as they will only buy their games off of Steam and nowhere else. Now, things have certainly changed. 10 years ago, if you were on Steam, that was it. You would have succeeded. Today, they have opened up that as long as you have $100, you can put your game on the platform. And because of that, it has kind of lost that mystique. And a lot of developers have unfortunately struggled to make a name for themselves on Steam. But regardless, it's still number one for consumers. If you have any intent or interest in selling your game, you're putting it on Steam, whether you like it or not. If you're going the mobile side, the, of course, two big ones is the iPhone App Store and, of course, the Google Play for Android. Now, I don't do too much in mobile, which is why this will be a very quick one. But what I do know is that if you're going to get onto these platforms, your game must be approved, as in it must meet the standards of either Apple or Google, respectively. If it doesn't meet that, they will take your game off or demand you make those changes. And as the stores and phones have been updated and involved, they will require you to keep updating your game or they will just take it off. And it can be very risky in its own ways in terms of standing out in the mobile space. GOG is a site that is kind of home to a lot of classic games, 
but they've also opened up their doors to independent developers. In terms of their actual market share, they are on the smaller side. I kind of include them just for uh, being complete and thorough in this discussion. But most often, they're not the store you're going to focus on as an independent or a first-time developer. Now, we've seen more and more third-party uh, companies get in with their own platforms. Origin is run by EA. Uplay, which I believe they've actually changed their name in the last few months, is run by Ubisoft. And while they are, of course, focused on their own games, they have opened things up to smaller studios. Speaking about opening things up to smaller studios, itch.io is basically the store by indie developers for indie developers. It is entirely free to use. You can set your own price. And a lot of students have put up game jam games or smaller projects on itch. It has kind of been like the new uh, stomping grounds or breeding grounds for a lot of any developers who are just starting out in the space. It has grown in terms of popularity and, re and renown over the last three to four years, but it's still like nowhere near the same size as Steam. But if you are looking to just put something out there in the world to see, it's just right here for you. And they are a very welcoming community as well for developers. Humble has also grown. Humble Bundle, or the Humble Bundle originally started as a charity to buy lots of games and donate to charities at the same time. But since then, they have transitioned to being their own store as well as publisher of a variety of indie games. And their Humble Publishing uh, firm has published a lot of recognizable indie games over the last four years. But kind of the quote unquote new kid in town is the Epic Games Store. And this is probably the most like fluid uh, slide for this section. Because when I first talked about it, it was like, yeah, it's just this little thing. Maybe it will survive. Maybe it won't. We don't know. But since then, Epic has thrown a lot of money into this. And they're trying to position themselves as the second store compared to Steam. They take less money from uh, sales on it. And their whole idea has been trying to create another store to compete with Steam. It has led into this kind of quote-unquote digital store war between the two giants. And while Steam is still number one, it has become a very interesting time to see what Epic will do to kind of court more independent developers and stand out. And of course the various uh, major consoles. Originally, the consoles didn't care about independent developers, but they have become far more willing and accepting of them, with each platform having a space for indies. Microsoft, in particular, has become very invested in courting and purchasing indie studios to make games for the Xbox and, of course, Windows. And if your game becomes big enough, kind of the sign that you are on your way to being a success is when your game is being courted or picked up by one of these uh, software or one of these uh, platforms to be sold there. Although you can certainly put your own game up there on your own, but there are more risks and rewards along with that that we don't have the time to get into today. So networking is a major point about the game industry, especially on the independent space. It is kind of an industry of brothers and sisters that everyone kind of knows everyone. And that means if you become well-known or you become liked, your name will get out there. And one of the best ways to do that is to attend conferences, whether, again, with the pandemic going on right now, a lot of them have shifted into doing things virtually, but there are still lots of local and state ones as well. So uh, a few of the big ones, we have PAX or the Penny Arcade Expo. This is kind of the uh, trade show by fans for fans, although it has opened up the doors to companies and developers pitching their games as well. They usually run major conferences 
all throughout the world. I know there is, I think, the PAX on the East Coast in Boston, I want to say. And I don't know where the trade show is on the Western Coast. But you can certainly look these up on your own. GDC or the Game Developers Conference. This is for the uh, Western Hemisphere, the major show for developers. This is for people who are in the industry wanting to talk to other people and kind of talk more about the craft of what it means to make games for a living. This is not where you're going to go to see the newest and most exciting games, but it's kind of like where professionals go to meet other professionals. They did go virtually last year. I'm not sure what they're going to be going for this year at this time. E3, this is the major trade show by the studios. Now, the interest level and popularity has waxed and waned over the last decade. Some have said that E3 is no longer relevant. Some see it as just a major marketing event. And who knows, by the time we, I do this presentation next year, I, I may not even include it just because of how things have changed so much when it comes to the industry getting its news. Now, if you're looking for information, starting to kind of doing research about the industry, this is going to be where you're going to find it. And there are many more sites as well. There are developers out there who have their own blogs or their own YouTube and Twitch streams that you can watch and kind of see them make their games in real time. But this is a great way to get started for yourself in terms of looking and listening to people who are making the games and kind of getting that firsthand knowledge. The first one is the IGDA, or the International Game Developers Association. At this moment in time, this is the closest the industry has to kind of a formal organization when it comes to the industry. <clears throat> Excuse me. They have chapters in every state. The chapters are usually ran locally by whoever are the developers and people within that state. Uh, here where I'm at, based out in New Jersey, I typically go to the one that's in Philadelphia. But there's also a chapter in northern New Jersey as well. And again, if you go to the IGDA, you will find links to each state's chapter, as well as to a variety of special interest groups that cover and talk about various aspects. And it is free to uh, kind of sign up there, but they do have a paid membership that also offers unique advantages as well. Um, Josh, now, if I can interrupt for just a minute, yep. I'm sorry. Um, it looked like we might have had a hand raised a minute ago. Um, did you have okay. a uh, question that you wanted to ask? Uh, we do have the, the Q&A if, if you had a question you wanted to ask and we can, uh, we can uh, uh, work on, on answering that if, if there was uh, something that you needed to ask. Yep, uh, let me know. Okay, go ahead and, and as that comes up, we can. Oh, okay, okay. go right ahead, Josh, thanks. Okay. So another site, originally game developer was called Gamma Sutra. And this was kind of like the major industry news and professional site of the game industry. But in the last six months, they have changed their name to Game Developer. And this is basically the trade, uh, trade site. So they'll cover news and major trends about the game developers and what is happening in the industry. They have a blogging section. That's how I kind of got started writing about the game industry, talking about any and all topics relating to game dev and game design. And if you are interested in kind of writing about things or putting these together like that, this is a great way to get started where other industry professionals will see your stuff. As an interesting point, that's how I got picked up to start writing and doing books. Was someone was reading my articles on Gama Sutra at the time, and they said, well, have you ever given the idea about writing a book? And now here I am with uh, four books published and a fifth one that I just finished. <laughs> and there are also additional books out there. And this is one of those slides that it can definitely change as things have grown. These are some of the ones that I have read. And I'm pretty sure they are all still available where books are sold. I'll, of course, have a slide showing my books near the end of this presentation. But there are a few more as well. And again, uh, there's a lot more out there 
on very specific topics about specific genres or specific aspects of the game industry. One of my favorite places is the GDC Vault. And like I said a few minutes ago, the Game Developers Conference is where developers go to talk to other developers, and they will have a variety of presentations and programs about any and every aspect of game design and game development. One of my dreams is to get a presentation actually pitched and accepted. And I keep like putting down they haven't done it yet, but I'm hoping for next year's conference that I have something I can really show off. But the more popular presentations, they will record those and put them onto the GDC vault. Now the vault can be expensive. They have videos that are both free and those that require you subscribe to watch them. But this is a very useful, just a complete source of, or well of information that if there's a topic regarding game design out there that you're interested in, there's a good chance there's a video or somebody covered it and it is archived here. But uh, we are coming to the very end. And you know, like I said, like with this presentation, I tried to move through it a little bit on the faster side because there is so much and there's still so much that I could, I haven't even gotten into, that I could get into, that I could talk about. But I try to keep things, you know, moving along so you're not all just listening to me rant for five to 10 hours. But to conclude things from this presentation, game development is a very passionate industry. I always like to say that it is a fun business, but it is still a business. People do not get into games because it is their backup job. It has attracted people who want to go all in and create games for a living. It is very fulfilling to do that. But that passion can be blinding. And if you don't understand the business side and the development and management side, you are not going to succeed. It is not the exciting part about the game industry. People don't, make, don't get in the game industry for a living to balance a checkbook and make sure that project stays on course. But those secondary skills are often what I see that divides the developers who succeed and can make a living from the ones that don't. A, a friend of mine said this, I mean, this is like the best way to say it. There is as much art in the business as there is business in the art. And a lot of people have always said that, you know, you either wear your artist hat or your businessman's hat. And what we've seen is that it's really a combination of the two. And my biggest advice to every one of you watching this right now, start learning about this stuff. Because how you mitigate risks is to know what those risks are. And while I did have that kind of scary section in this presentation, this is still one of the best times to get in the game industry. There is so much knowledge out there and so many things for you to study that you can be ahead of the game compared to industry professionals who, you know, they may have years of experience at a major studio or even being in the independent space, but they didn't have that knowledge and they had to learn and make those mistakes on their own. And to give you kind of like one positive example, when I interview a lot of first time or even just like early on in their career indie developers, they have often made amazing games, even more so than professional developers in the space, because they, they did the research, they studied games and they understand the development side and they did a lot more as in their first and second or even third game than some people do on their 10th or 20th project. So if you can start learning this now, if you start preparing, it will help you tremendously when it comes to making these games. And it's better to do this now while, when you are in school or you're just starting out than again when you're trying to balance a livelihood on top of everything else. But uh, I believe it is time for our Q&A, and then I'll have my slides where you can follow me after that. So 
if anyone has any questions, uh, feel free. Okay, Josh, it looks like um, we have one question here. I'll go ahead and read that and uh, uh, let you answer that. Um, how do you go about learning a programming language? Uh, do you have any recommended languages? And should you start with an easier language before learning one that's more complicated? That is a good question. And let me preface this by saying that I am not a programmer by trade. I have spoken to lots of, of programmers, even people who have built their own game engines to design their games with. When it comes to learning a programming language, the first thing you need to do is, well, you have to just start getting into it. Uh, some of the more like basic or more widespread examples of programming language would be stuff like uh, C or C++ or C Sharp, uh, JavaScript. Uh, like I said earlier, when, if you're going to use Unreal, I believe they use their own uh, distinct uh, scripting or programming language. And again, that leads into the difficulty and depth of it. But usually something like I know with Unity in particular, they do use, I believe, a C++. No, I, I think it's like C++ or C Sharp and JavaScript. Now, again, there are plenty of programming languages out there. Now, to help you learn it, one of the advantages, again, of so many developers, you know, doing more in terms of uh, game dev and doing these more publicly is that there are tons and tons and tons of videos and tutorials and game dev streams that you can watch of people literally programming their game and coding it that you can take notes from. And for each one of the major game engines, uh, sorry, game engines, they also have tutorials and things you can watch as well. And really the best thing that you can do is just start, like pick one and just start working with it and see what you can do in that space. And like I said, for each engine that you want to use, they're going to have different rules from it. I would say if you want to start in terms of the general aspect of it, there are, I know schools have programming clubs and programming courses. They can at least give you the basic idea, the idea behind, you know, like the methodology of programming. And that was one of the things when I was in high school, I did take several programming classes in that respect. And that kind of helped me build up my understanding of programming or uh, the program logic that goes into coding these things, because it is very uh, specific in terms of your thought process and taking something from your head and putting it into code. So if you can start, you know, taking those courses or even start doing things on your own, you'll start to kind of build up kind of that philosophy that goes into it. Okay, we have another question here. Uh, any advice or resources for someone interested in the writing or the story side of mm. games? Um, and uh, I'll ask the, there are a couple of other parts to this. Uh, do the big studios hire specifically writers? And <laughs> what is the process of hiring for this like? Mm. That is another good question. It's one that I honestly don't have too much experience in specifically because I focus more on the design side. There are uh, special interest groups and stuff on the IGD about writing and writers in that space. There are studios out there that specifically focus on writing and storytelling. I would say if you want to look at a studio, even maybe get in touch with them to ask them for advice, would be fail better games. And I will put that in the uh, chat as well. I'll see if I can find their link really fast. And the reason why I mentioned them is that they're a studio that specifically uh, specializes in storytelling. They are very much writers and storytellers first and game, de and game designers second. And when it comes to most studios, the story will oftentimes be developed in-house. They may bring on like a 
famous uh, writer or novelist to either tell a story or kind of a collab or a collaboration with the studio, or maybe even just to flesh things out from their original concept. And Fail Better has been a studio, their major claim to fame is a game called Fallen London, which is a browser-based kind of very story-driven game. And they've also opened things up for internships and kind of helping people out. Wow, wow sorry, my tongue got tied there. Helping people out when it comes to writing. But typically writing, it's one of those things that I don't know how much in-demand major studios have for it. But it is something that has become important for a lot of smaller developers and studios as well. And I recently interviewed somebody who also writes about games. And one of the advices that they gave is that there is a difference between writing a book or, you know, writing something like I do and actually writing a story, developing an entire narrative along those lines. But it is something, again, that it is its own unique, I guess, a subsection when it comes to learning and doing stuff in the game industry space. Okay. Let's see. Does anybody ha else have a have a question that they'd like to ask? And while while you're looking into them, let's see if there is a special interest for writing from the IGDA. And yes, there is. I will put a link to that as well. So that is a link to the uh, special interest group on the IGDA that is specifically is about game writing. And yet, if you are for, if you don't have a question, if you are looking for more information, definitely check out the IGDA. Like I said, it is at this time, like the most quote unquote formal organization regarding the various disciplines of the game industry. Okay. Any other questions? All right. And, oh, go ahead, Josh. And if anyone, oh, I was going to say, if anyone does come up with someone to get in touch with me, you know, after the stream or after the video, uh, I'll have a slide that shows my major content information. And I welcome everyone to send me a message. I am always open to uh, fielding questions and talking about game industry and game design. But if there aren't any more questions, I'll put up my uh, final slides and kind of say a thank you and goodbye as well. <laughs> so if you are interested in my books that I have out on game development and design now, these are the four that I currently have published. I have a fifth one that I just finished. Uh, 20th Central Games of Study, that is kind of my entry level book about it's essentially 20 games if you're looking to be inspired to make a game and why they're so interesting or unique these are 20 that i recommend while the game design deep dive series that's kind of like my more professional or uh educational series each book in that covers a specific genre and i basically go top to bottom in terms of the history methodology and design of them so the one that I just finished is all about free to play and mobile games. And these three cover platformers, roguelikes and horror respectively. But uh, thank you so much for watching, whether you're enjoying this, uh, watching it live or you're watching it recorded on uh, the library's YouTube channel. I'd like to thank Tim and the rest of the library for having me out here virtually. And if you'd like me to come back, I am always here. So if you want to find my works, these are the best places for it. Game-wisdom.com is my major site. I have also transitioned to doing stuff on Medium. And I work for a site or a kind of a virtual magazine, Super Jump. And I post a lot of my stuff over there as well. My YouTube channel, Game Wisdom, where you'll find my daily videos on all manner of design topics at this point as well as my interviews with developers from all around the world. 
And if you want to send me a message or follow me on Twitter, I am on there at GW Bicer. And like I said, if you do have, if any questions do come up from you or any questions after this, uh, just feel free to send me a tweet or DM me. I am always uh, open and readily available. All right. Well, Josh, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. We really appreciate your spending some time with us here today. And thank you to everybody for, uh, for coming to the program today. We hope you enjoyed it. And uh, definitely check jmrl.org for additional programs for all ages uh, coming up down the road. Thank you again, and good afternoon, everyone. Have a great weekend. Take care, everybody.